welcome to the latest episode of the shindig uh, it's your hopefully favorite podcast about archaeology and it's brought to you by the red river archaeology group i'm dr tom horn your host and i'm here as ever with our ace producer luke barry hello and today we've got another real treat for you another one of my great friends it's uh, dr terence christian and Terence has a fascinating site. Um, I know him from working with him on his project when he was looking at Second World War air crashes in Scotland. There's a lot of stories about that. Just email me for details. Um, but Terence is a brilliant archaeologist. He's also brilliant at doing uh, desk base assessments, as we call them, uh, in commercial archaeology. And Terence has been doing some commercial work by himself on a, an amazing site. And now, before we discuss the site which is an incredible time capsule survival um we need to talk a little bit about the period in which this this structure um that turns to look at um was was built and this was uh in uh, a, a it's a conflict known in north america as the french and indian war you may know it as the seven years war and um we're looking we're going to so we're going to go back to the the mid 18th century and we're going to go to Pennsylvania. And Terence is going to tell us a little bit about what was happening in terms of this, this conflict, the French and Indian Wars that's known in North America, and what's happening in the part of Pennsylvania where he was doing this quite remarkable project. So Terence, welcome to the podcast. And yeah, so the Seven Years' War, uh, are we correct to think of it as the first global, the first world war in effect? First, thanks for having me, and uh, and yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's really a, a funny little conflict because, like a lot of the global wars um, from from throughout history, uh, you know, think of the Roman period, First World War, Second World War, Korean War. Uh, you know, possibly today we won't go down that road, but uh, um, it really starts with a small conflict, and it just snowballs. They they can't stop the the, the aggression in one location and keep it as an isolated conflict, and it's it's the two biggest kids on the block that eventually just square off around the world. Um, in this case, it just happens to be in what is today Western Pennsylvania, uh, a, a at one point very significant part of the world, uh, now probably less so. Um, so the reason it's so important is that uh, at this point, you've got the, the French in, in New France, uh, which is basically French Canada today, uh, Ontario and Quebec. And then you've got the, the 13 colonies uh, on the east coast of the what is now the United States. Uh, and these are the two global empires. Uh, at this point, Spain is kind of waning in in uh, it's uh, power. The Dutch have, have basically gone away. Uh, so it's just these two last empires that exist as a global sort of uh, power uh, that's keeping the world order in, in check. Uh, and they have this passive agreement that they'll stay in their respective backyards. But the Ohio River Valley is is too enticing uh, for either of them to actually not want to move into. It's this very fertile area full of natural resources, farming potential, trade potential. Um, and so that's where we end up is a, a what's called the uh, the Ohio River Valley Fork, um, which is three rivers, actually. Uh, it's the Monongahela, the Allegheny, and the Ohio. And they're all navigable rivers, and which means you can move from French Canada and the Great Lakes uh, down the Ohio River Valley and eventually spread out uh, west of the, the Appalachian Mountains. Um, so it kind of connects these two, these two colonial areas. Uh, both sides want it, and both sides have this agreement that they'll leave it alone until they figure it out later through diplomacy, which, of course, never happens. When we, we come onto the scene here, this is about 1750 is when this is starting. Um, and it, it stays with importance until about 1815, first kind of quarter of the, of the 19th century. Um, and what, what really happens is it's accidental. Uh, so the British uh, colonies decide that they want to push beyond the Appalachian Mountains uh, and, and push into this, this new territory because the, the original 13 colonies have been bought up uh, by major landowners uh, or the cities are getting too crowded and there's this whole area that they've technically claimed as far as the the land will go uh, for for britain so there's this passive movement into the ohio river valley the french meanwhile see this as a, as a uh, push into what they claim is also their territory um, and so it's it becomes a, a conflict where uh, the two are trying to secure it by the least means possible and end up securing it by the most means possible um, so Early on, the, uh, the, the British push in with, with settlements, um, and then the, the French um, actually go and, and they build a tiny little fort, uh, Fort Le Boeuf, um, at, the, at the fort, what is now Pittsburgh. Um, and, uh, and it's where we start, where we start the sort of uh, American myth, because the guy who 
who's headed out there to scout it for the British and also realize that the French are there and warn them to, to basically back off uh, British claims uh, is none other than George Washington. The um, George Washington. The, the George the... Washington. Yeah, founder of the United States. Yeah. Um, the, the American god, uh, as, you know, the, the apotheosis of George Washington starts here. Um, so he's out there. He's, he's at this point uh, a, a junior officer in the American uh, colonial sort of loyalist uh, provincial regiments. And I'm not a regular British soldier by any means. Uh, more we'd consider militia today, uh, frontier militia. He is a landowner, uh, which is why he's there in officer capacity. Uh, but uh, he's also there because he's working on the frontier as a surveyor, as a private business surveyor. So he's kind of there in two, two sort of competing notions. Um, but he's out there and he, he basically uh, is the one who goes and he sees the French are there and he warns them away. Uh, Governor Dinwiddie um, says basically go out there and kick the French out as politely as you can. Uh, and he, he has, a, has a parlay with the French and the French basically tell him to stop it, uh, that his small party it, you know, can, can just take a hike. So he's very junior. He goes back, puts his tail between his legs, kind of runs back to, to Dinwiddie, uh, tells him uh, what, uh, what's happened. Um, and, uh, and Dinwiddie uh, then tells him, well, this isn't going to stand. You need to go out there and you need to basically, uh, you know, set up a fort and, and make a claim uh, in, our, in our own right. Um, so they, they then, the, the Americans, the British, whatever you want to, um, to call them, uh, they actually head out and they build their own fort in, in the same general area. So we now have two competing forts, Fort Leboeuf um, and Fort, uh, it's like William Trenton or something like that. Uh, that's the British fort. And they're, they're within talking distance, essentially, of each other, both very small. Um, the French realize that this is, is occurring uh, and they are not going to stand for this, this competition. And so they send a party down to kick the British out. You can see the snowballing starting to occur. Uh, and they build what has become Fort Duquesne. Uh, they do kick the British out. The British return to the to the colonies, to Pennsylvania and Virginia. Um, at this point, it's a competed claim between the two colonies. And, uh, and they build Fort Duquesne. Um, so Fort Duquesne stays there. And that's the French fort that, uh, that really starts this whole this whole process. The French then send a, a emissary down to the British holdings uh, to mention that, hey, by the way, we have this fort here. Uh, and this is French territory. Uh, and George Washington has been sent to once again tell the French to basically get out of British territory. Uh, and this is where we get the Battle of Jumonville Glen, where uh, Washington, just by sheer luck, stumbles across this, this either French scouting party or French diplomatic party, depends on which side you're on, French or British. Um, and, uh, and he takes the, the initiative to basically set up a, a, an ambush. Uh, and he kills the, uh, the French uh, um, kind of mission, um, including the Comte de Jumaville, uh, who's the, the diplomatic envoy. Um, he didn't really mean to, I don't think, start a world war in doing this. He was just trying to protect the frontier, as he had been told to do. But he accidentally, um, you know, essentially assassinated the, I believe it was number two or, or so, French uh, colonial official uh, in that part of New France, uh, which is, you know, not the greatest diplomatic start. Um, and it's from here that the snowball starts. So. The Jumonville Glen uh, massacre then uh, requires the French to respond. Um, they push George Washington back into what becomes Fort Necessity, the circular fort where he pulls up and he makes terrible tactical choices. He puts it at the bottom of a, of a valley, of a, of a wide valley, uh, which allowed the French to just kind of sit in the trees with their Indian allies and just pepper the, uh, the interior of the fort. Um, so literally the, the walls can't be high enough to block them from rifle shot and musket shot. Um, and he has to surrender. And it's very awkward because Washington at this point sees himself as a, as a gentleman. Um, so he parlays with the French, thinks he comes to terms, but of course the whole thing's conducted in French, which means he essentially admits that he killed a diplomatic mission, that it was entirely Britain's fault, uh, that he shouldn't have done this, uh, that he was totally in the wrong, and essentially cedes the territory to France, which is also not the great greatest diplomatic uh, um, start. Uh, this... I think follows him the rest of his life and it really drives his political ambitions to, to kind of overcome Fort Necessity's uh, um, kind of uh, um, embarrassment at his unculturedness of not speaking French. He's a gentleman who doesn't speak French and also losing so drastically uh, a, a what would be considered a pretty easy win uh, for the British at that point, um, considering the size of the, of the two forces. Um, so at this point, the, the Fort Duquesne is secure. Washington's humiliated. 
Uh, the British are humiliated, and so they make the decision that they are going to take Fort Duquesne and the rest of the forts of the Ohio Valley that the French control and really bring it under British dominion once and for all. And so they set off with uh, the first expedition, um, Braddock's expedition, um, to take Fort Duquesne. And thus we've entered, at this point, the, the opening act, the Battle of the Mons, uh, you know, the, the Varus disaster, uh, the start of, of, of a world war. And that's, well, that's great. And, you know, I, I definitely recommend it. It's, it's one of these wars that, you know, people don't, you know, because everyone will be thinking about the, the Revolutionary War. But if you really want to understand it, as Terence alluded to there, if you want to understand what's driving George Washington, if you want to understand exactly why the Revolutionary War happens, at least when it does, you have to understand what's going on in the, uh, as Americans say, the French and Indian War or, or the Seven Years' War in North America, uh, as we would view it in, in, in Europe. So that set the scene. So this, this, this is, you know, this war uh, occurs um, 17, late 1750s, early 1760s. Where do you come in with um, your project? How does that fit into this, this conflict? And, and um, yeah, tell us how you got involved. Sure. Um, the, one thing I will mention that I, I love about the Seven Years' War is that much like the Hundred Years' War uh, of medieval fame, uh, the, the Seven Years' War is actually nine years, uh, which I just, you know, who names these things? Um, <laughs> so, you know, just a bit of fun. But uh, yeah, we come into it with Braddock's defeat, um, that where the project sits is, is in a town called Bedford. And we'll, we'll talk about why it's named Bedford uh, in a bit. But um, it's this, it, at this point, uh, there's nothing there. There's tr traders' cabins, essentially, this frontier British push. Uh, into the mountains. Um, it's just beyond what were the foothills of the Appalachians, uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, moving towards the Ohio Valley. And uh, at this point, Braddock is pushing uh, towards the um, uh, towards the the uh, Fort Duquesne. Um, right now, we're looking at seventeen, as you mentioned, seventeen fifty. So we're looking at seventeen fifty uh, four fifty five. Uh, and then we come into really in 58 is when the project uh, really hits, but that's roughly where we're looking at. Um, the earliest archeology span we've seen is 1753, um, which is these traders cabins. So it's all a really compact time frame of about five years, uh, is what we're looking at as in terms of our archeology, span um, for the initial, initial phase of the structure. Uh, Braddock is, is building a, building a road to the frontier and, and Washington's there to help him because Washington is one of the only people who really has been out there surveying and knows the area and is a gentleman. So he's embarrassed and he's trying to regain that, that uh, trust, but he's also knowledgeable. So they can't really discard him wholesale. Uh, so he's, he's kind of lucky in that, that respect. He also conveniently has own, his own personal land out there. So he's also kind of doing site inspections of what he owns as well. Um, so it's a bit of a, of a commercial uh, and, uh, and kind of government role. Um, in, in Washington's own life. Braddock builds this road, Braddock's road, um, from uh, what is then uh, Philadelphia all the way out to, uh, to what will be Fort Duquesne. Uh, the, it's, it's not one road, it's kind of a snaking um, kind of tributary system that feeds into this one military road. So it starts in Philadelphia, but there are also uh, places coming from like Baltimore, coming from Northern Maryland, uh, other colonies that, that are quasi sending troops. And it's one of the first uh, combined arms that we see with, um, with the British uh, forces. So when Braddock begins his campaign, um, he's, he's only got about 1,400 troops under his command, regulars under his command, some Indian allies, some colonial uh, loyalists, uh, but they do ship quite a few uh, British troops, uh, naval troops, artillery from Britain to take part in this campaign. Um, because they see it as hugely important to take Fort Duquesne. Um, so it is, it is a, a dedicated, uh, uh, large force compared to what's at Duquesne uh, to, to topple these French claims. Um, it would have gone really, really well, uh, except that it's, it's done in secret. George II uh, announces that, yes, this can go ahead. It's done in secret. But then there's all sorts of different power plays that are occurring in London, in, in Westminster, uh, and people decide that, no, if we're going to do this, I want my slice of the, of the glory. And so they announce it publicly that we're going to take Fort Duquesne, which is the worst thing you can do militarily is to announce that you're going to attack something. Uh, and so the, the, the whole process snowballs and it becomes this, this rather large force, but it also alerts the French that the, uh, the fort is going to be attacked. And so the French quickly send reinforcements from New France, from, from Canada, 
uh, down the Ohio Valley to reinforce it. It all would have worked really, really well, again, blundering into world wars, um, because the French should arrive within about four days or so, um, but the British should take a lot longer to march. Braddock is really good at building a road, and his, and his troops are also really, 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 really good at, uh, at, at marching at speed. And so the road is completed well before the French are realizing uh, what's happening. So the troops actually garrison Fort Duquesne about a week or so uh, prior to when Braddock arrives. Um, so the whole thing is just a, 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 a confluence of stupidity, um, really. It's, it's just people blundering into, into accidental conflict. Uh, and when Braddock arrives, uh, there's all sorts of theories that as to how he's defeated, that he's in a, in a glen, that, uh, that you know, people are firing down on him. A lot of this comes from the Benjamin Franklin and his 1791 memoirs, which have now been proven to be slightly imaginative, um, you know, a bit like Tacitus. Uh, mm. And uh, yeah, so, so, but he has defeated. Um, there's about uh, 900 or so forces, uh, French uh, and allied forces in Duquesne. And there's uh, 1,400 or so British forces, and the British lose badly. There's about 39 killed on the French side, um, and more than half of the British force uh, are actually killed or wounded in the battle, including Braddock. Uh, Washington, building up his his ego, uh, is actually the only officer to survive this this conflict. Um, so he he marshals the forces, extracts them back to Philadelphia, mentions this, this horrible defeat. Uh, the British are embarrassed again. Washington. Is embarrassed, but he's also the only surviving person, uh, officer. Uh, so, so you know, he's kind of also put on this plinth of of kind of uh, a touch relic of, of Braddock's, you know, mortality. Um, but the British decide that again, this isn't going to stand. They have to take it now. It's it's British honor at this point. It's British regular troops' honor uh, to take it. And so um, they plan the Forbes expedition. The Forbes expedition, 1758. Uh, we had 1,400 troops, if you recall, um, with with Braddock. When Forbes marches on Duquesne, he comes with 6,500. Um, so this is, you know, the British have have vastly escalated their commitment to taking this frontier fort. Um, as I said, it's it's less about the Ohio River Valley at this point and more about basically showing the French who's who. Um, so this is where our, our site comes in, is that Braddock's Road connects with our site, but it's really our site sits and is built um, right around the Forbes campaign, uh, that we think it's it's inexorably tied to the Forbes campaign, um, and that uh, Forbes himself most likely um, either stayed in this house uh, or or was within literally a stone's throw of it. Uh, so this is a so just to tell listeners, yeah. so this is a, a a building. It's a house that's extant now, um, and you are trying to find out what about it. You're trying to find out if it's and not any of it survives from the period? Yeah, so so when we were approached for this project, uh, it was landowners who had purchased this house. They, they had rented it for years as a, as a shop, as a small greengrocer. Uh, and the next door, it was, it was a split house. Next door was a jewelry store, a uh, jeweler retired. And it was, it was offered to the other tenants for sale so they could own the whole structure. Um, and they did buy it and they started renovating it. And when they pulled the walls down, they realized that they had something far older than they thought they had. Um, so they called up a colleague of mine at Temple University, and he's a Rev War historian, so he pitched it to me as an archaeologist, and, uh, and, and that's where we started the project. We had nothing to go on. Uh, they, they had a theory that it was old, uh, but they didn't know how old uh, it, it was. And so we were really starting from a blank slate, um, kind of like opening up a trench and, and scratching your head and going, I, I think we've opened something really complex, and this is going to take a while. Um, so, so we didn't know it was Forbes campaign at the start. Uh, we just knew that what we had was seemed to be what they showed us originally uh, was a log structure, uh, but it was a it was a really odd log structure because only, it was only three sides to a square. Uh, one wall was missing, and it wasn't that it had been cut off. We had the terminus of the logs, so it was definitely a three sided pen structure. Um, and the local theory was that somewhere around this house was the powder store that housed Forbes's guns and powder when he was marching to Fort Duquesne. And so the locals were really excited that this might be Forbes's lost powder store. Nothing of the of the original fort that Forbes built built at Fort Bedford uh, as one of his staging posts, his primary logistics post, exists. So this would be the last piece that exists. So everybody's really excited, um, and uh, and yeah, we we um, we started peeling back the layers and to and to see what we could find about this. Do you you got that? 
Arts Commission. So you're effectively you're you you work in commercial archaeology. Um, and what happens next? Do you you just go you go to the site, or is is there work you need to do before you even think of going to 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 visit the site? Yeah, so we got the commission as a, as a commercial entity. Uh, I was based at Temple University at this point, writing history of battlefield preservation uh, from 1776 to present. So kind of intertwined with, with that, that study. But we did this as a commercial project um, because we could move it more rapidly through the system. With the university, it would have taken a while to get the field school done and get the students out there. This we could do in a couple of weeks, theoretically. So it was better for the, uh, for the clients who wanted to open their shop and obviously make some money on, on, you know, in their new, their new structure. Uh, so the first thing we did when we spoke to them, we had the address and we started doing map regression. We didn't know when we were going to be able to get to the site, but we wanted to get an idea of what was around it. Um, maybe we could discard it as a 19th century farming structure or commercial building or something like that. We could we could solve it really easily for them, you know, a week done. Uh, so we did the map regression and, and we found that there were a series of uh, really nice old uh, campaign maps from the Forbes campaign, uh, 1758 to about 1763 is when they're done. Um, and that gave us a good idea of where the site sat within the larger campaign itself, and also what the eventual Forbes fort, what became Fort Bedford, uh, actually looked like on the site. So one of them is, is actually a really nice one that, that shows uh, the entire fort structure, the fort network. Uh, it's an oblique aerial watercolor, essentially, is in the Royal Archives. Uh, so I've never been to there, there personally, but I like the idea that I got to poke around the Round Tower. Uh, in, in Windsor, uh, which made me feel kind of, you know, archaeology geek, but yeah. Uh, so it was really nice as well because it gave us an idea of where everybody's situated. Um, on that map, it shows where Washington's uh, troops are, are encamped uh, as, as one of these outposts. Uh, it gives us an idea of where Forbes is uh, and what the, the entire network looked like. But it didn't give us a good idea of what the structure actually was. It was too far, far zoomed out. And likewise, the, the fort maps themselves that are schematics given to uh, both the Crown and also to the Commander-in-Chief North American Forces to kind of give an idea of what's actually happening on this part of the campaign. Uh, those were actually a little bit too zoomed in and unlabeled. So they didn't give us any real resolution of what the site uh, was. We then fast forwarded into the 19th century and, and thought, you know, all right, the early stuff, the, the low-hanging fruit didn't really give us much. So let's do a full map regression. Let's start as, as late as we can with uh, 1950s USGS quads. Uh, kind of the equivalent of ordnance survey maps. Um, and we'll just literally regress backwards by decades. Um, and the best thing we got was the insurance maps uh, from the mid to early 20th century back to the, the latter part of the 19th century, uh, what are called Sanborn fire insurance maps. And they're really nicely done. Uh, they're almost government in the sense of, of how well they're laid out, how well they're detailed. They tell you how many windows are on a site, how many doors, what it's made out of. Uh, and, they're, and they're done by address. So we were very easily able to find the site and do this, this regression, uh, 1885 to, uh, to 1925. Um, and what we found was that the, there's one structure that really stuck out. There's this angular structure that didn't match any other of the, of the sort of grid pattern buildings, um, in the region. Um, so it, it kind of piqued our interest. Uh, and we started teasing that, uh, that thread. Um, so we pushed it a little bit further back when we went to the state archives. And that's where we found maps from about 1877 back to 1850s. And that same angular building shows up in all of those as well. So we're fairly certain at this point, it's not a late 19th century barn or commercial structure, uh, but it's something that's existed for, for some time. Um, pushing it further back in the local archives, uh, we then found uh, what were our kind of gold mine. Uh, 1828, there's a, a redraw, uh, a, a kind of copy of a much earlier town grid. Um, and then we also found the 1761 original survey of the, the entire plot of land that was known as the Manor of Bedford, which is this manorial system uh, that, that is the town today. So it kind of gives us this full dossier of, of what the site looked like, but it didn't give us much information specifically about the building. It just gave us a lot of question marks that there was a structure on this site. Maybe it's the one we're looking at. Maybe ours is a little bit later because it seems to respect the street a little bit better. Uh, so we're, we're kind of... Um, um, in a in a curious mode uh, where, okay, it's not going to be that quick to discard the site. We're going to actually have to go out and visit it and see see what it actually is on the ground. Uh, so we did that. We, we scheduled a, a site visit. We went out for um, two days was the plan. Uh, we ended up leaving a week later, which should tell you something. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we kept telling the hotel we we're at, hey, do you have any more room? Can we extend this a little longer? And they were very happy to, this is in January, so they were very happy to have us because there was nobody there. It was us and the staff. Um, 
but we we kept we looked at the building and when we walked in uh, the site we were originally told it was one room that they were interested in this this log cabin room that that piqued their interest between the time that they told us about the log cabin room and the time we got there they pulled the the sheetrock uh, uh, plaster walls uh, off the rest of the structure uh, but they hadn't told us by the way the room is actually the entire building um, when they pulled it down there was far more there than anybody expected which is why we had to extend um, and what we we came across was yes there was the log cabin room which was a three penned room it was the three sides to a square uh, but then we also found that there were these um, these quarter timbered walls these these kind of classic sort of Tudor looking uh, walls that then had uh, brick shoved into the the interwall space um, to variety of theories why insulation fire breaks um, but uh, depends on who you talk to about that but they were definitely old they were hand formed bricks they weren't modern brick uh, so it was it was really quizzical uh, there was still all sorts of material that was left there we learned from the landowner that uh, uh, that the person who owned this half of the property the the jeweler who had retired um, he was terrified of the upstairs he felt it was haunted so he just right basically chucked stuff up the stairs and left it. He had owned it for about a hundred years, his family, and nobody had ever gone up there. Uh, so it was just absolutely full of random stuff. They found corsets and shoes from the Victorian period. Uh, they had newspapers and things from the latter half of the 19th century. Um, there was random jewelries and watches. Literally there were diamond rings uh, that they had just shoved up there. Um, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a, of a cultural history gold mine as well. Uh, which we've now recommended they give to an archive to have them look at separately as we were there for the building. But we started crawling through this, this structure uh, with, uh, thankfully this was at uh, the, uh, during COVID regulations where you could, you could work, but, uh, but you, you still had to keep distance, which was great because we already had our N95 masks with us. Um, so we didn't have to worry about any of the dust. We were already PPE, which, which was kind of nice, uh, but cause it was very, very dusty and, and uh, you know, horsehair walls and things. Um, so we started going through it and uh, and we just ended up having more and more questions about what the, the site actually was. Nothing seemed to make sense. The way the building was laid out, we clearly saw that there was more than one building phase. At the time, we counted up to four the first day. Um, materials were different. There was old wallpaper that was hand, uh, hand-blocked wallpaper, uh, but it was on walls that appeared to be later 19th century. So we were kind of confused as to why they're using historic wallpaper uh, on, a, on a, what seemed to be later building. Um, so we, we said, all right, we're going to come back tomorrow. We're going to, we're going to sort this out. This is too much to take in in one, one go. And we came back the next day and we started doing a full survey. We, we decided that night at dinner that there's no way around this. We're just going to have to basically take out the, uh, the distometer and start shooting the walls in and making a full fl floor plan, uh, start doing some standing building survey drawings and photographs. And we're just going to have to record the whole thing, uh, cause it's going to be just, it, you just can't keep it in your head. There's just too much there. Um, so we did that for about the next five days. Uh, we, we went through top to bottom. Uh, the only place that we quickly ran out of was the basement where we did the whole survey. And then at the last corner, uh, we found some insulation that was clearly marked asbestos. And, uh, and we kind of went, yeah, all right, we're going to leave now. Um, that's fine. Um, yep. So thankfully, we were told that that was actually done. They did have a record of when that was installed and the rest of the building was asbestos free, which made me feel a lot better. Uh, that was done in the 50s. Um, so when they put a boiler in. Uh, so, so we, we took all the standing building surveys, um, and, uh, and we started processing the data and we expected this project, uh, the original contract was two weeks. Um, we are now finishing writing the report, uh, and we are about a week away from two years. Um, so it, it's, it's been an interesting project and, uh, and, and thankfully uh, for the landowner, we, we had, uh, negotiated a flat fee. So the two years hasn't affected them. They are open for business and it hasn't, you know, financially crippled them. Um, but it's been a really interesting project because. The, one of the things we did at the time was the last day we said, do you mind if we take some wood samples with us? We have a, a contact at Penn State. Um, we don't know how old this building is, but you're on the cusp of viable carbon-14 dating. Um, for those who are familiar with C14 carbon dating, you can do really old dates um, and you can do some new dates, but you can't do really new dates because the closer you get to present, uh, the more kind of uh, uh, off the, the, uh, uh, the record gets. So we're really on the cusp of it kind of mid 19th century is, is the, is the limit. And the method that we were doing to, uh, to take these dates, to give us some sort of boundary that we could work off of because the, the, the standing building side was quite confusing at this point, um, was that, uh, when you take the wood samples, Penn State helped develop this method. I mean, it's what we call a wiggle match. And so you take the wood sample, 
And it's kind of a cross between dendrochronology and carbon-14. You count the, the rings of the tree, and you take the outer and innermost ring, and you date those two, those two rings. Um, and with those two points, as long as the spread of the rings is large enough, you can then put that onto the carbon spectrum, um, and you can kind of move this, this, these two points around until they match uh, what you expect to have on a carbon count. Uh, and it's the only way that you can get really modern dating of that. Uh, we thought it was going to be really, really useful and, and good and give us a, you know, a pretty solid boundary. Uh, the three samples that we took all came back with wildly different dates, uh, three different parts of the building. Um, it did confirm that we had multiple building phases, uh, but it also confused us quite, quite a lot because what we ended up with was the, um, the, the log structure, what we thought was the oldest, um, was relatively contemporary with the front of the house, uh, which was the, the quarter uh, sawn timber and brick structure. And so now we're left with two different building styles are within about 20 years of each other. Not uncommon, but the, the bounds of, of uh, probability meant that the, um, the actual uh, structures could be contemporary. Both could be contemporary with the Forbes campaign. Um, so uh, kind, of, kind of confusing. We also took a, a, a piece of brick um, at that point, and we sent that off to a lab in Arizona that we were working with uh, for thermoluminescence dating of that uh, um, piece. Uh, and, uh, and that came back as even more confusing because that told us that that brick uh, was probably the oldest brick in Pennsylvania, um, which was, and it had a hand wrought nail that had been driven into it, which is one of the reasons we chose it. Uh, so we have a lot of material evidence that shows that this is a, a very rustic structure that's being done rather quickly, hand, hand formed bricks from local clay, uh, hand wrought iron spikes that match uh, the, the rough contemporary period of the Forbes campaign. Uh, a brick that dates somewhere between the late 1600s to uh, to mid 1700s, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's it was we were really glad we had the dating, but it, it almost caused more questions than uh, uh, than answers. So at that point, um, we took a deep dive, and, and we really started going through all the material culture that we had collected, the the wallpaper samples. Um, the trying to reconcile those with building phases, building small uh, little models of the site out of, out of paper and cardboard, um, working with the GIS systems to try and overlay things and deleting and adding parts to try and make the building phases work. Um, and, uh, and what really caused us to have the aha moment was when we came across an archive, which I didn't know existed, but it's the National Archive uh, for Historic Wallpaper, um, and it's maintained by the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, it's, it's brilliant. We were going to access one of our pieces to them, but we came across a, a, a piece of wallpaper that nearly matched our main wallpaper, this blue and gold uh, wallpaper that's really high quality. Um, and also the border, uh, which was these sort of pineapple pinecone brown borders. It wasn't a, a color match, but it was clearly the same block prints that were being used. And they had really tight dates for their, their wallpaper. Um, they, it was only produced for a few years. They have the entire manufacturer's collection of it. Uh, so we knew that those were basically turn of the century, uh, turn of the last century, that is 1700 to 1800. So that structure was definitely upstanding at that point. Um, we could we could favor the dates that uh, the carbon-14 and, and thermoluminescence dates uh, that said that they were very early buildings with, with confidence, um, and we could start working heavily on the building phase uh, side of things and trying to tease out which building came first, how are these adjoined, uh, you know, and, and is any of this related to the Forbes campaign um, itself? Confusing all of this is, is probably the, the most uh, um, intriguing. There's a, inside the structure, there's actually a secondary roof. There's a roof within a roof uh, that confused everybody at the start. Um, and uh, we're still not sure when that comes from, but we're fairly certain that that is a later addition from the mid 19th century, uh, that it sits atop the older structure that has these wallpapers and things. Um, so when we went through the whole process, what we think we've, we've come across at this point um, is that that, that penned structure, that, that three-sided log structure, the reason that it's causing us so much grief uh, in terms of how it relates to the archeology span um, is that it has clapboard siding on it, but the clapboard siding that, uh, that, that exists, uh, the nails are actually behind immovable walls of the, of the front building. So somebody has to get the smallest hammer you've ever seen, be a, a ghost, I don't know what it is, to hammer these nails. There's no way that you can put those nails in uh, with the structures as they are today. 
Uh, the gap between them, I couldn't even get a, a, um, a camera back there to take a picture of it. We had to take it from obliques and later we're going to go back with a, um, with a fiber optic camera. That's how, that's how tight this, this gap is. Um, so our, our theory as to why these structures are the way they are is, is one of two. Um, either the, uh, the wall, the, the depend wall was put up wholesale, kind of like an Amish barn racing. They just put the, the clapboarding on it and then raised it with block and tackle in one movement to extend the structure. Uh, the guy who owned the structure at the start, this, this guy, Henry Wirtz, was a, uh, was a sutler and was a, uh, a tavern owner. Um, and he's, we know he's in this area in 1771 when he actually holds the first court in his, in his house. He hosts it in his, his tavern. Um, but we, we you know that he also then gives his house to his son. And so we're thinking at this point, perhaps this is the, the butted out section where his son and his, and his new bride kind of moved into the house, that it's a separate entity and they just kind of live together happily. So perhaps it's an almost barn raising style. The other theory is perhaps these, these logs are actually reused from uh, the fort or some other sort of outbuilding that's, that's earlier. And so we're getting a false date that basically somebody's reusing a derelict building uh, in this, um, this structure. We went back about uh, now about eight months ago, took another round of, of uh, samples to answer these questions. Some of the siding, uh, one of the, um, the beams of the, uh, the brick infill structure, uh, and we took some of the chinking between the log structures that was still there that you can't pull out. It's, it's literally wedged in there. You, you, you have to take the building apart to take it out. So it's, it's definitely contemporary. And we sent those off. Those came back and completely blew our theory out of the water. Uh, the chinking is contemporary with the, uh, the log structures. So it was put there when it was built, 100%. Uh, the siding is uh, contemporary with, the, um, with the, the beam that we took a, a, a sample of, uh, and the beam itself is roughly 1770s. So the whole idea that this is uh, somehow like a, a later addition that he's building for his son around 1800 is completely, completely wrong. So we had to renegotiate the whole thing. We had to start from scratch again, rebuild our little cardboard models, relook at all of our data, relook at all of our map regression, um, and basically start from scratch. And we're really glad we did because this last set of, of data, what we came up with um, was actually that this structure, um, we believe, is the, uh, the last remnant of what was known as the Rising Sun Tavern. And the Rising Sun Tavern is, holds a legendary status with, with the Forbes campaign, because it's, it's originally known um, as the, the tavern and possibly officer's house, uh, where the, the garrison uh, of the fort would go for recreation. That was literally across the road from the fort. So if you're an officer and you're coming there to stay on Forbes campaign, and you're looking for lodging, uh, if you're Washington, uh, you know, coming through on business uh, to, to meet Forbes at the fort, and discuss how to build this road out to Fort Duquesne to, to take it from the French, this is where you're staying. Um, now, can we say Washington lived here and stayed here? No. But the the, the probability that he went, came to this tavern, had dinner, probably had rooms in, in the uh, the tavern, stabled his horse there, very, very high. Um, the main taverns, that angular building that I referenced earlier, the main structure, uh, that burned down um, at the end of the, the 1800s. Um, but the second half of the structure that was the, the addition this structure, what was at, we believe, uh, the tavern owner's house, uh, that survived. Uh, Wurtz's house, this, this, uh, this, this early 1771 or earlier house. So we don't have uh, any, reverend, uh, any record of the fort surviving that was dismantled in the 1760s, burned to the ground uh, to make way for the new town. But this structure, this, this last remnant of the military civilian complex uh, seems to have survived. Um, and it's, it's the kind of point at which um, we can really put Forbes on the ground and say, you know, in this grand scheme of the World War, where this all started, of, of how uh, this, this uh, British presence across what becomes North America uh, begins, you know, what the United States and Canada basically as nation states, um, it's here. It's, it's this structure. Um, this is the, the, the nexus of this campaign that takes Fort Duquesne, that takes the Ohio River Valley, that eventually sets up the, the, the capture of Canada. Uh, that eventually sets up this this uh, this worldwide conflict um, that if you want to really draw the thread thread out um, spawns British dominion uh, across the seas, the Napoleonic Wars, eventually the, the true British dominion through the Victorian period um, that then sort of wanes in the 20th century. Um, it really starts at this this building um, in Bedford, Pennsylvania, in roughly 1758.
Um, it's where everybody's planning this this imperial expansion. I'm yeah. I you know, we'll have some video of this of just me sort of a gate in my mouth. <laughs> yeah. so, so, I mean, we, that's we did not up. expect it. No, we did not. Expect no, it. We, well, you we, wouldn't, we really would thought, you? Because you're like, yeah. you know, this is the modern world in a in a in a in a in in one in, in one building, and I mean, even it weren't associated so closely with with these wars, these campaigns, George Washington, it would be a fantastic survival. But to be able to the brilliant work that that that, that you guys have done to you know really robustly show this you know you've shown you're working um and you've got the historical side and you've got the the hard science to back it up as well is just i mean it's just i mean it's an absolutely stunning story and um we're so glad um i'll speak to to luke in a second but we're so glad that you've chosen to share this with us and maybe luke's got a uh, a comment from he's a non-archaeologist but i'm completely blown away um i think all archaeologists that listen to us will be blown away thank you so much terence and i'll, I'll just get luke have a, a wee word at the end and here I, I should i should mention real quick yeah. uh, just on, as an aside um we're still progressing with with part of the project that question of how the the three-sided structure ended up attached to the brick structure the house um still a mystery anybody's got any theories we're open to it uh it's it's the one that confuses us it it, it runs afoul of of every archaeological thought of how do you get a nail behind a wall without taking down the wall when the, when the wall hiding it is is older than the one that was put up it's very confusing um but uh but yeah our, our theory of presence and again we're happy to have any other theories uh chimed in uh, they can be passed along is that it's a it's a standard style for the western pennsylvania it's called dog penned house um and uh, and it's a standard extension and we just think it's basically so close in time uh, to the Forbes campaign, that the the scientific dating and the the material culture uh, and the the standing building surveys can't tease out that like two year period. We'd have to excavate to actually get that. We're planning to do that. The yard next to it has, from our map regression, shows that it's never been excavated. That's never been touched. It's always been an alleyway. So you know, going down the pipeline, we're we're talking to landowners and we might put a trench in there to see if we can kind of define that further. But uh, yeah, if anybody's got any theories on how that works, we're totally open to it. Um, we're we're kind of stumped on that part, but the the dating is clear. This is the Forbes campaign uh, tavern. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. I I don't have anything to add uh, apart from wow, uh, Luke. I guess um, from a pop culture point of view, has work to do with George Washington kind of become more of an interest to people since something like Hamilton has become such a huge pop culture phenomenon. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Washington, uh, there is a fantastic statue in the uh, Smithsonian Institution Museum of American History, which is literally called the Apotheosis of George Washington. And it's a monumental kind of Zeus-like statue of Washington uh, holding a, the sort of state half naked in a toga, um, you know, with his finger raised in a, in a, a philosoph philosophical way. Um, so Washington's always been there. He kind of uh, um, comes to prominence and then wanes and comes back again. Um, but I, I think as the as the you know father of the nation sort of thing, um, every school child comes across him. Uh, every time you find something that's that's Washington related, I mean Tom can can attest to this. It's uh, you know he's everywhere in the states uh, and and um, it, it automatically springs an interest with with everybody involved. So when we found the Washington connection, the town was thrilled. Um, it's, uh, yeah. And, and it's, it's one that we're, we're also teasing out the rest of the town. There's a, there's another house in the, in the district, uh, which is called the SB house, which is allegedly Washington's headquarters during the whiskey rebellion. That's a whole nother story. It's the, the last time a president commanded troops in the field. Um, but we think that that's actually not Washington's headquarters. We think it's a different house and that's a whole nother story. So, um, so Washington is very prominent in the town and, and the fact that there's a connection here, um, you know, has really, I think uh, sparked the interest of the of the community, sparked the interest of Western Pennsylvania, and we're hoping when we we have a publisher lined up, hopefully for this uh, uh, this this end report and and, and monograph, um, that uh, that'll kind of draw attention to back to Bedford as this this really important hub of early American history that uh, is unfortunately kind of waned with uh, with movement to air travel and, and interstate highways. Um, so Washington is always at the center of that. Well, that's just absolutely fantastic. And it just remains to say thank you so much again. So that's Dr. Terence Christian. And uh, yeah, if you've got any ideas, just contact us and, and we'll 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 put you in touch. But um for now, thank you and uh goodbye, Terence. Thanks so much.
there you have it folks that is our interview with dr terence christian i'm sure you found that as interesting as we did it was a great one to record and uh, i can't wait for everyone to have heard it and i'd love to see some discussions about it if you want to hit us up drop us messages on twitter on facebook leave comments below in the youtube comments uh, we'd love to hear from you we'd love to hear what you want to hear on the shindig podcast if you have an interesting archaeology story maybe hit us up about that because we'd love to have people on the aim of this game is outreach it's to to get this information to as many people as we possibly can and to have fascinating stories on it so if you have a fascinating story that you want spread to the world hit us up we'd love to do it on that account if you like this podcast maybe give it a share let people know that it exists uh, if you know people that would be interested in it send it their way give us a like on uh on youtube give us a subscribe give us a follow on any of the podcast apps that you're listening to it on and leave us a rating or a review see you next time on the shindig